Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just to let you uh, know for today, we'll be giving you a debrief on three of our deputy involved shootings. And then once uh, Chief Huffmeyer updates you on the facts of the shootings, I'll take questions for all three of them after. So that way we can go in succession and make sure that it uh, rolls smoothly. Okay, Chief Huffmeyer. I'll do my best to not uh, bump your microphones up here. So if I could direct your attention uh, to the monitor here to my left, we'll go over the agenda for this afternoon uh, very briefly. So we're gonna be covering, as the sheriff mentioned, three uh, deputy involved shooting incidents that have taken place this year. The first one we'll be discussing took place on March 17th, the second on February 27th, and uh, then the third also on March 17th. That's not a uh, typographical error. We actually had two incidents on the same day. Uh, so we'll be talking about all three of those. So first we'll start with the incident that took place March 17th, the address 3900 Pan American Freeway. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the numerics, that's right there by uh, main event in the Carpenters Union off of I-25. Approximate time of the incident, 2.27 in the afternoon. Um, there's some information, if you've attended one of our previous uh, briefings, we, we put this up there for your benefit so that in the event you want to IPRA any of the case information, you've got the case and CAD number as well as the primary detective that's assigned to the case. So I won't repeat all the numbers, but it is there for you in case you need to reference it in the future. So the, the next slide and the first thing that you're going to see is going to be the dash camera footage from one of the deputies that responded to the initial incident. Uh, the initial incident in this case was called in as a suspicious vehicle. Uh, there were a total of four deputies that responded to the scene. There were two field training officers and their trainees that were riding with them at the time. Uh, so as the footage rolls, and I'll just walk you through it now, you're going to see the deputies respond to the initial vehicle, attempt to make contact with the person or persons inside of that vehicle. The vehicle then flees the interaction. Uh, fairly short pursuit takes place. Uh, the suspect vehicle, as you'll see in the video, goes into oncoming traffic for really no apparent reason. Um, causing qu quite uh, significant danger to the innocent motoring public around. The ter uh, termination point of the pursuit, again, takes place there at, in, the, in the parking lot of those businesses. It's terminated by the use of a, a pit maneuver, and then the shooting takes place in pretty rapid fashion after that. So we'll play the pursuit in its entirety. We've sped up the pursuit just for the purposes of the, the time constraints here today, but you'll see the pursuit in its entirety, the pit maneuver, as well as the shooting that takes place. And then I'll discuss a little bit about the shooting specifically at the end. Six, 
some of the things that are happening inside of the car when you watch the, the unredacted and unsped up footage as we're watching the pursuit here is you hear the training officer interacting with the trainee um, who is driving the vehicle. He's, he's giving him some information about the manner in which we conduct vehicle pursuits. And there's two vehicles in a pursuit. The primary vehicle behind the suspect vehicle is not responsible for any of the radio communications. So you heard him there. Can you just pause it for a second? So you heard him there telling him that the other vehicle is going to be in charge of radio communications. That's what he was telling him. So they're trying to, in the midst of what is started to be a chaotic situation, they're still responsible for providing training to those trainees that are inside of their car. Go ahead. This is the individual in oncoming lanes of traffic. And you can see there is no traffic in the correct lanes. So for reasons that are inexplicable to us, is choosing to drive um, into opposing lanes of traffic. Pause it one more time, Jamie. Uh, one other critical piece of information just to repeat, and I, and I think most folks generally know this, but a pit maneuver, um, uh, certainly by our policy, can only be executed at a certain mile per hour. It's got to be 35 miles per hour or below in order for us to attempt that maneuver. There's some safety reasons behind that. When you send a vehicle horizontal to its, its uh, normal direction of travel, the vehicle can tend to flip. Individuals could be ejected, so for safety reasons, and you can hear the, the field training officer telling his trainee, he's monitoring the speed, he's looking at the speedometer in the vehicle, and you know when you're driving the vehicle, you're, you're, you're um, receiving a lot of sensory information, so you're trying to calculate, you know, is this vehicle at a safe enough speed? What, am I on a curve? Are there other environmental considerations that I need to take into account before I attempt a pit maneuver? So the whole time they're trying to get him below 35 miles per hour, but also have enough view ahead of them for oncoming traffic or other uh, things that might be in the area for them to execute the maneuver. So it does happen here as he, he approaches those parking lots <laughs> enough that they're able to attempt that. Um, So I know that all happens in pretty rapid succession. So you have the pit maneuver. Uh, unfortunately, because of the way that the median is there, uh, another vehicle is not able to go around behind. That would be ideal, like a textbook style pit maneuver would be to have a second vehicle go behind to block the subject from being able to go in reverse. That's not how this ends up. There's only two of them. So they're both head on with the vehicle. It's, it's actually the pit sends him into the curb uh, which helps uh, immobilize the vehicle for us. He's not able to move. The deputies get out. And I'm going to say this. When we have these press conferences, we're going to tell you the things that we could do better, and we're going to show you the good work that our deputies are doing. There are certain things about this incident that could have been done better, and we're going to look at those. You heard the excited utterance on the part of the deputy. Um, I can see just as well as you can see what's on the screen. Um, it appears clear that uh, it was an unintentional discharge of the firearm. Thankfully, nobody was struck, um, but that is something that we will look at in great detail throughout the administrative review of the pursuit. Why did the pursuit happen? The shooting, why did the shooting happen? Um, and at the conclusion, we're gonna make whatever necessary adjustments we have to make, provide additional training or, or whatever the remedies are that come at the conclusion of that. So I'll be the first to tell you, there are things that we could have done better. We're, we're willing to own that. Um, and rest assured, we'll, we'll make steps to make sure that those things get done. All right? Go ahead, Jamie. Some suspect information about the vehicles inside. Why did this all happen? What were they doing? As is commonly the case, um, 
These individuals are suspected of being involved in, in narcotics activity inside of the vehicle when they were initially att attempted to be contacted there um, where this all started. Information about the suspects, the driver and the passenger, some fairly significant criminal history. You've got charges of possession of a controlled substance, unlawful carrying of a deadly weapon, receiving or transferring a stolen motor vehicle. Um, the charges from that day would, would be the, the aggravated fleeing, so specifically running from a marked unit with its lights and sirens on, signaling them to stop. Uh, the passenger there, also a fairly significant criminal history, DWI, domestic violence charges, aggravated battery, uh, some fraud-related things, worthless checks, aggravated battery on a household member, again, possession of a controlled substance. Oftentimes, that, that is a common theme that we see with, with these types of, of incidents. Shoplifting, aggravated fleeing, um, obviously the passenger not charged with that, um, but he did have an outstanding felony warrant that day, so he was booked, he was booked. Information about our deputy. Uh, the deputy who fired, Deputy Zabo, he is uh, deputy first class. It's his second uh, deputy involved shooting, and he's at f about four and a half years of service. So, so that's the first one. Again, that was the, uh, in chronological order, that was the second shooting that happened on, uh, on the 17th. But we'll move on now to uh, February 27th. 2020 Manal Boulevard Northeast at the Ramada. Case information again, February 27th. The time is approximately 11.15 at night. Again, you have the case and CAD information as well as the primary detective that was assigned to the case. This incident started with our uh, auto theft unit uh, who is out day and night aggressively pursuing individuals who are in, engaged in auto theft and, and other criminal activity. They came across a vehicle who had an illegible temp tag. They attempted to stop this individual. Um, evasive driving behavior in the parking lot of the Ramada that's followed by the subject crashing into the building. The subject then exits the vehicle shoots into the hotel to break the glass of a, a key card access door to get into the hotel. Um, at that point, the deputies really, you, you have an individual who has fired recklessly into the hotel. They don't know what their intentions are, obviously trying to evade law enforcement. We have potential hostages or other individuals who are innocent inside of the hotel. I mean, the, the level of, um, risk of this individual being inside the hotel, it's, it's, uh, I think it goes without saying that the, the deputies are um, actively and aggressively trying to, to apprehend this individual before he can harm anybody inside the hotel. If an individual is willing to just fire indiscriminately into an occupied dwelling like this, that's somebody that we need to catch and we, we recognize that. So you're gonna see a string of videos. You're gonna see the initial attempted traffic stop right here at the front of the business. You'll see the individual attempt to flee and then crash. You'll hear communications um, via radio by the deputies who are on scene there in the parking lot. You'll hear the shot and then we'll, we'll transition to the lapel cam of one of the deputies that was involved in the shooting as they chase the individual through the hotel. He actually goes into the hotel changes clothes, walks casually right back out the front door and then attempts to steal one of our marked vehicles. Um, so uh, quite the criminal mind, I think it goes without saying. Uh, unfortunately for him, we were able to catch him as he's in the driver's seat of that vehicle um, and ultimately it was a canine deployment that got him out of the vehicle. We'll see that too. Um, and he is taken into custody without further incident. Go ahead. crashes there into the column. Working on it, working on it. 
Pause there one second, Jimmy. You can't see him, but he is still on the driver's side of the vehicle, reaching into the car, retrieving um, items. Unclear exactly what those were. He obviously is armed with a gun. Don't know if he was retrieving the gun or if it was already on him. But you'll hear uh, the deputy in the truck there on the right-hand side of the screen who does have a view of him, that he's reaching into the vehicle and he's still there. There now, he's reaching in the vehicle. That was the shot, uh, you guys Car heard shot. that, that shot. pop there. That was the individual shooting into the hotel. We need units here now. We need to start doing an HR on this hotel. They fired the shot into the hotel. And uh, police lingo, he's saying an HR on this hotel. Again, as I mentioned, we don't know. Is this individual going to take hostages? We've got innocent people inside the hotel. It's, it's operating 24-7, as all hotels do. Um, and so we, you have a, a very dynamic situation, and he's, he's asking for more resources and people to start uh, going into the hotel to clear that out so that we can apprehend the offender. This is video that we've transitioned to one of the detectives uh, in, within our auto theft unit as he arrives on scene to assist with the apprehension. Fire shot, fire shot. What's your way? Which way? You hear the description describes him as wearing uh, just a white tank top. Right? So that's initially what they're looking for as they enter into the hotel, because that was his last known uh, clothing description as before he entered. Sheriff's office! So, so just to reiterate, you have an individual who fled from law enforcement, fires indiscriminately into an occupied hotel, and is now running armed through the hotel as the, the, the detectives and deputies are trying to apprehend him. We transition back to the front of the hotel. You're going to see him casually walk out the front. He's now wearing a red shirt, uh, but he exhibits some behavior that, that are give a clue to the deputies that are on the front that this individual is is uh, is the suspect. It's one of our canine units. That's the suspect as he casually walks out the front. trying to confirm the clothing description. Are we sure that that's what he was wearing? Because this guy just walked out and there's nobody else around. It's 1115 at night. The likelihood that that might be him is pretty high. So it's a great level of awareness on the part of the, of the canine deputy. So just prior to this, you can't see it from the canine unit's lapel, he, he starts to run. The offender starts to jog, telltale sign that this individual, no one's jogging through the parking lot at 11.15 at night, right after there's been a shooting inside the hotel, um, unless they're waving down law enforcement. This individual is not doing that. Um, he makes a beeline straight for an unoccupied marked unit that was unlocked, uh, gets into the driver's seat of the vehicle, we're there within seconds. Thankfully, he's not able to steal the vehicle um, and put anybody else in danger. We're trying to extract him from the driver's seat. Obviously, he doesn't want that to happen. Um, and then you'll see the, the canine deployment here in just a moment.
deputies are hands on. You can hear the handcuffs. The canine handler gives the dog commands to release. I mean, instantaneously. As soon as the threat level is is decreased and we've got them in custody, we're we're giving commands to the canine to release right away. Um, go ahead. We don't have the luxury in a situation like that where an individual is trying to gain access to one of our marked vehicles of taking any chances whatsoever of that individual getting away. There's weapons inside the vehicles, as everybody knows. Not only that, but this, this person just crashed into the hotel, no consideration whatsoever for anybody else around him. So we take those things very seriously. What we recovered from the scene, loaded handgun, a significant amount of narcotics, over 400 fentanyl pills. Our deputies that were involved, Detective Dunbar, he is also a deputy first class. It's his second shooting. He's been on for 11 years. Also in our auto theft unit, Detective Mora, also deputy first class third in, uh, deputy involved shooting and approximately seven and a half years of service. I, I could probably go on for an hour with information about this suspect's criminal history, but we tried to make it simple so that you know folks could understand the magnitude of what this person has been doing in our community. Uh, he's 40 years old. His name is Lupe Vargas. He has a juvenile history that started when he was 11 years old. He was charged with 10 felonies as a juvenile and 7 misdemeanors as a juvenile. Uh, as an adult, he's had 31 adult felony charges against him, an additional 13 misdemeanors, a total of 32 violent crimes that he's been charged with, and amongst those, 16 of them were firearms related. So we are ecstatic that we were able to get this person off of the street and out of our community. Uh, regarding the shooting, he was not struck. All right, the, uh, the, the final shooting we're gonna discuss today, um, probably the one that's garnered the most public interest, that did also happen on March 17th, 2024. Uh, the location of that shooting, uh, there's actually a couple of locations, but we'll call it the, the, the final location. It was 8412 Zadeco Avenue Southwest. Here's our case information sheet. Approximate time, 7.52 in the morning. Again, the address, the case and CAD information, as well as the uh, primary detective assigned to the case. So we're going to start with, um, how did we get here? How did we come to capture the individual who was wanted for uh, the murder of the New Mexico State Police Officer? Um, I, I think it's, it's known now, but it started with a tip from a cashier at the Murphy's gas station. All right? uh, that individual recognized the subject. Uh, the subject went in to purchase uh, some items that required him to produce identification, and he did so. Um, he actually provided his ID, so th this individual was heads up and called it in, and we responded to that call for service, just as we would any other call for service, to attempt to locate the subject. So you'll hear the 911 call and the information uh, that the deputies received. Um, yes, it's Eli Wilson. Um, I'm calling in Less than five minutes ago. 
did he uh, leave on foot or in a vehicle? Um, I, he was on foot, I believe. Did you see which way he went? Uh, Mike will be camera by the time they get here. So you'll see now uh, an, a satellite image of where the Murphys is at Coors and Blake, that's in our South Area Command, and then how far he went. Uh, deputies went into the area immediately to attempt to locate him, but you can see there's there's quite an amount of uh, just vacant land that's that's not built on. So he's cutting through those areas, cutting through neighborhoods, he's on foot. Uh, but ultimately, we do catch up to him about approximately 40 minutes after the initial call came in because uh, we weren't going to stop looking for him until we found him. So this is the address 8412 Zadeco where the incident concludes and he's taken into custody. And it, again, it started there at uh, the intersection of Coors and Blake. So the, the next set of slides or, or the next portion of video you're going to see is that there's a lot of it. There's a lot of video, and of course you guys are, are and, and have already IPRA'd the video. You can watch it in its entirety. You can, you know, uh, view whichever portions you like. But for, for today's purposes, we're going to uh, follow the lapel cams of the two deputies, uh, one deputy and one lieutenant who fired, um, as well as uh, an assisting deputy who shows up on the scene right as the individual is taken into custody. And you're going to see them chasing the individual through the yards, um, repeatedly giving him commands to stop, trying to take him into custody. But keep in mind, this individual has been um, the subject of uh, what could be described as a manhunt uh, ever since he was identified in connection with the murder of, of Officer Hare. So I can't say enough good things about the way our deputies handled the situation, their tactics, their professionalism all the way down to the length of time and the lengths they went to to provide medical attention to this individual uh, for the multiple gunshot wounds that he sustained. He's only alive because we rendered aid to him at the scene. Um, so we'll, we'll follow those videos now. Again, you're gonna have a, a part of it will be a split screen and you'll see those, those videos are linked up so you can see the perspective of multiple people who are simultaneously attempting to locate him in these yards as he's running. Go ahead. This is Lieutenant Marujo. He's showing up. He is the individual who first spotted the suspect. Ten four. So we have a large perimeter with visual containment of the entire area. Now remember, sorry, Jim. Remember, we got a pretty specific description of the suspect from the clerk at the gas station. That's already been communicated to all the deputies that are actively looking for him. Hey, bro, come here. I got a B. I, I got a BMA. Come up here. Come up here. Drop down. He's running. He's running. Get over here, bro. He's running. Yeah, west down. He's running west down. time remember it's 40 minutes after the initial call came in. we do have a pretty um, a pretty good perimeter set up it's, it's large but we still have a, pr a pretty good perimeter set up so we felt confident that if we encountered the subject in the neighborhood and folks held their perimeter position that we could do a, a methodical search if necessary and still apprehend him so you'll hear the lieutenant reminding folks to maintain your perimeter positions and then you also have because we have a sighting of the individual and an active foot chase through the yards, you have active attempts to go and apprehend him as he's fleeing. Units on that west side. Maintain your perimeter. Maintain your perimeter. So they just saw him. They know that he's probably in the backyard of this house that's right in front of them. Come on, 
Thank you, love. Lieutenant Marujo sees the individual. There's a large trampoline in the backyard of one of these uh, houses, and there, the retaining wall in the back is, it's got to be close to 10 feet high. The uh, suspect is attempting to use the trampoline to jump and vault up over that wall. Um, and so when uh, de uh, Lieutenant Marujo fires, that's, that's where he is in relation to Lieutenant Marujo. Shot back, shot back. You can see the trampoline there. He's gone up over that wall. So you're going to hear it, it's faint, but you can hear it, I'm going to pause it just to, to preface what you're about to hear. There is a neighbor uh, directly across the street on the second floor looking out towards us um, into the yard, and she's able to see the suspect is laying down right on the other side of the wall. The deputies can't see the individual, he's laying down. And she yells to the deputies, watch out, he's right there, he's laying down. Um, thankfully, that gives the, the deputies a moment of pause. They're able to check that near corner on the other side of the wall and see that he is, in fact, laying there uh, directly on the other side of the wall, right, right on the other side of the, of the pink uh, playhouse that's in the back of this yard. So you have both the lieutenant and deputy are moving up together as they reach that fence. Simultaneously as that's happening, uh, deputies are adjusting their perimeter. As you, as you hear them calling out new addresses that this individual is confirmed as being seen in the backyard of this address or that address, they're adjusting their perimeter so that we can, we can be in a position to cut off any avenue of escape. Um, you're going to watch uh, Deputy Cloud's lapel cam, and the reason we have this on here is that as the uh, individual is, is running, he uh, loses control of or throws, uh, unknown exactly, the weapon that he was carrying, which was a handgun. And you'll see it very clearly go flying over the wall right in front of the deputy as he's pulling up uh, to his perimeter position. Oh, man. Oh, you're right. Don't fucking move, no, no. I got it, I got it, I got it. Oh, 
Here we go. What's your name, bro? Go. 8412 Lost He's starting rescue. He's starting medical for the offender. Hey, Gus. What's your name, bro? Deputy recognizes there's critical evidence in the roadway. He's, he's signaling another deputy to make sure that that's secured. It was uh, just slightly raining that morning, so they were able to find an empty cardboard box and, and put it over the, the gun just to try to preserve any evidentiary value that it may have had. Um, it probably goes on for a good 10 minutes of them providing medical aid to him. Chest seals, trying to pack the wounds. The subject was, or the suspect was struck four times. Uh, he did survive, and I credit his survival to the fact that despite the reasons of why he was wanted and despite what he was doing today during the apprehension incident, um, our deputies maintained composure, slowed everything down, start rescue for him immediately. I mean, it's not two seconds after the handcuffs go on, the lieutenant is starting rescue. So I think that's a testament to our professionalism um, and the way that the incident was handled from start to finish. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Whatever the fuck your name is. <laughs> Subject was nice enough to carry his wallet with his ID in it. it makes our job very easy. You got his ID, Jeremy Alexander Smith. Just as before, some evidence photos from the scene. This is a photo on the left of the weapon that went over the wall and was recovered from the roadway. It's an aerial shot of the backyard where the apprehension took place and then the scene after the apprehension. You can imagine just by, by watching it yourself, there's multiple locations and multiple yards that had to be processed. It was, it was certainly a long day for the shoot team that had to process this incident. Uh, regarding our deputies that were involved, Lieutenant Marujo, it's his second deputy involved shooting. He's been with our agency for approximately 13 years. Deputy Lau, Deputy First Class, it's his third deputy involved shooting and he has approximately seven and a half years. Uh, regarding Mr. Smith, obviously he was wanted for the, the murder of New Mexico State Police Officer Hare. As I mentioned, he was struck four times and he's 33 years old. Uh, obviously there's some information that we're not able to comment on regarding his criminal history and other jurisdictions. Uh, we'll, we'll leave that information to the, the criminal prosecution. Um, in New Mexico, he did not have a documented criminal history um, prior to, obviously, the incident that, that precipitated all of this. So with that said, I'll, I'll turn it over for questions. Uh, if I'm able to answer them, great. I think the, the sheriff will probably answer uh, the majority of, of those. Uh, and thank you again for your attention and for being here. Thank you. All right, I'll take questions on our first deputy involved shooting at 3900 Pan American. Um, was the, the deputy that shot was not the training deputy, right? The deputy that fired the shot was not the, the deputy that was training the other one? He was the, he was the FTO, yes. Okay. Um, was there any discipline meted out, and where did the bullet impact? So discipline, that goes on for the administrative investigation once the criminal investigation is complete. Um, but in terms of that, to answer your question directly, I know what your follow-up will be is I can't wait for um, a criminal investigation to wait for an administrative investigation. I have to make sure that for not just public perception, but for training issues and for issues that we obviously, obviously see on the camera that that deputy is pulled from where he is and then more training ensues. And that's continuing as we speak and make sure other issues that we do see, what everybody else saw in the video is addressed appropriately so we can move forward as an agency. Okay, and where did the bullet impact? Uh, the bullet impacted, I'm not gonna answer that specifically until uh, I'll let the detective uh, discuss that, but somewhere in the front of the vehicle. 
Sheriff, sure, you mentioned in that shooting you may want to see, like you acknowledged that things didn't go right, didn't go as you planned. Can you kind of further um, elaborate on like what went wrong in your eyes, so to speak? Uh, everything that went wrong is you always look at uh, from beginning to end. And you look at why the pursuit was initiated to begin with. You look at what happened during the pursuit. You have to remember that these things are rapidly evolving for any deputy. Uh, they become violent. Uh, did our techniques work? Do we look, need to look at policy and procedure, not just for the safety of deputies, but for the community? And of course, at the end, what tactics are utilized? What tactics don't work? Um, as you can obviously see here, as we stated, that we heard an excited utterance. That's something that we need to address immediately. Uh, that's why we made a decision to uh, pull the deputy out of the field for further training and evaluate everything. Uh, because for all of us, we have to make sure it's fair from beginning to end. And um, we need to make sure that we put a deputy in the field that we're confident with and make sure that we're all safe. Any other questions on that? Just a point of clarification on the impact question. We don't. We don't have any information on, on where it impacted. We don't know. Okay, just the front of the vehicle, though. I, could, I couldn't even tell you that. We, we simply don't know. Well, someone knows. You guys just don't know here. No, I'm saying time. there was no impact location located. Oh, they didn't even find the bullet. Correct. Okay, or a bullet hole. Correct. Any other questions? All right, second um, incident at 2020 Manoa mm -hmm. Boulevard Northeast. Do we know how he got a change of clothes? Did he break into a room, or did he have like a backpack on him to, with a change of clothes? How did he change clothes and get out of there? We don't know, uh, and I'll have to look at the interviews itself. We just know that he did change clothes. Where he had those clothes could have been grabbing something from the vehicle that he crashed into the building with, something in exchange within the hotel. Uh, that's what makes this all heart-wrenching and also worried for the public as he's running and he's a danger to the public and not just our deputies, but into a full hotel with people walking around. That's a, a duty that we need to make sure that we act and stop the violence. We don't know specifically where he had that shirt. We just know he tried to, as you can see on the film, tried to walk out and act like nothing happened at all. Then he tried to take one of our deputy units. And you mentioned that started with the auto theft unit. Did that turn out to be a stolen car then? Or what was the status of the car after all? I, I can, I can answer that, sir. So, so the, the initial reason for the stop was the, the vehicle had an illegible temp tag. It was not stolen, um, at least reported stolen, on the night of the incident. And remember, for auto theft, that's what they're looking for also. Eligible tags, tags that don't belong on the vehicle, everything that, go, that, that leads up to a stolen vehicle or a tip to stolen vehicle. Do we know if he had a room at the hotel? Is he staying there? <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, I was <laughs> no, we don't. You can see, obviously, he's probably done this before. If he's had a room uh, during that time, I believe that the female that was with him was attempting to rent a room. Um, we're starting to see a lot of people in the community start to step up, and not just on, on the third shooting with the store clerk. We're starting to see employees tired of the violence here in Albuquerque, and they're actually assisting us. And if we look, that uh, his accomplice is trying to rent a room, and that was denied and then things escalate quickly. So at the time, he did not have a room. They were trying to get one. Yes? What's the name of the canine, just to get credit to the canine? I, don't, I do not know which canine Clooney. that is. Clooney? Did you hear? Canine Clooney. Clooney. Um, you know, and I'll address that. Thank you for that question, actually. A lot of people will ask, he, he, he was violent. We know what happened going in, and we have to stop his action. But he goes into a vehicle, and there's two or three deputies. This goes back to the argument uh, years ago on why we need canine and less than lethal tools. As you see and give credit to our deputies, they didn't use lethal force, uh, which they could have. Um, and that deputy apprehended him with, uh, of course, injuries, and we took him into custody, and therefore he'll, he'll, he'll uh, stand trial. Um, the moment when they fired, uh, it's really, it really happens really fast. You can't really see. What did they say what prompted them to fire? And also, so both deputies fired in that moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yes. Do we know what prompted them to fire in that moment? Because you can't even really see what they're seeing from the lapel. So I'll go back and, and answer your question with another question. Is what safety do those deputies have to worry about the people in the hotel? Even this comes back to a question, even if we don't know at the time if he was unarmed, he had a firearm, you hear the deputies in the lapel cam, so he has a firearm, this is where I have to, it's our responsibility to make sure that everybody's aware in the public and educate them. We don't need to wait for him to point a firearm at us, but we can go to numerous case laws in reference to a violent fleeing felon at that time. Do we happen to know how many people were in the hotel at the time? No, we don't. I just know that it was way too many for me. Any other questions? 
All right, we'll go to our third uh, deputy involved shooting. Oh, I think Faith has Oh, no, oh. Jeremy said it. Uh, it was your Okay. okay. <laughs> go ahead, Myra. Myra, there. Oh, no, you're good. Thank you. Uh, it's, you know, yes, go ahead. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I have a couple of questions. I don't know if this has been confirmed officially. Um, there's ring footage, and, and I didn't want to step on you guys' toes, so I didn't release that, but there's ring footage of a flatbed or white truck, um, him drive allegedly driving back and forth in that truck in that neighborhood where he was eventually uh, caught. Has that been confirmed? Because I know the biggest question was how did he get from to from carry all the way down to Albuquerque? He stole the car or whatever the case may be. But the, the type of car that he was driving, has that been confirmed? And then we also have video which I didn't release yet because I own to be respectful. But in this video that you guys have, he has brown boots. But in the video that we see, like when he's pacing, he has white shoes. So I'm guessing at some point he had changed, you know, his gear. But just to, is it is it still safe to, has it been like officially confirmed that that was that car that he was in? No, and I'll do this before. And like I said, I'm, I'm always transparent. I told you before, I'd also tell you when I couldn't release information. <laughs> things that, and things of that nature that are that detailed, I will answer questions in reference to the apprehension. But due to the nature of the investigation, confirmation, I, I won't do that uh, because I don't want to hinder any further investigation at least that we might have. That's um, When the first shots were fired, uh, you can't really see because the lapel is behind the wall. Was that when he was jumping on the trampoline? Yes. Yeah, yes. Oh, he was shooting out when he was jumping on the trampoline trying to get over? Yes. Okay. And then just for the record, um, did, did Smith ever point his gun at deputies? On there, I won't answer to that nature, just for the apprehension, just what I told Faith. So everybody's clear, and you're going to have more questions. Like I said, I'll be very transparent, but if it's going to um, convolute an investigation or ruin it at any point, I will not answer those at this time. Too important of a case. The Ramada and, and the apprehension of Smith, we're, we're seeing more community members stepping up and, and giving detailed information. Do you think that the tide is turning on community members just tired of it, of the crime, and helping law enforcement? I'm telling you, in totality of our community, we're seeing a complete paradigm shift. Uh, the community is tired of it, to answer your question, yes. Um, they're working in concert and helping law enforcement. Uh, other people that we've said that people have been calling them saying, why are you cooperating with law enforcement? Everyone's tired of it. Uh, it's going to take a team. Uh, I've been telling people for years, along with uh, my command staff that's standing beside over here, uh, we depend on the eyes and the ears of the community to further any tips, uh, to further any investigation. If community members want to stop, they need to help us. Um, and we'll always bring tools, technology, law enforcement, anything that we can bring to make sure that we take a person into custody, curb crime, tamper down on crime, all of the above. Anything else, anybody else? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. I do want to clarify, there was a mistake on Deputy Lau's uh, body camera, or on his the slide that mentioned how many shootings he had been in. It was incorrectly stated that he's been in three shootings. This was his first, and he has served approximately five years. So that slide was wrong. I'll correct that before I send it your way. Okay. And uh, 